Hello, and welcome to Mystic Dog Mama, the podcast for soul-led dog mamas, where you'll discover how to best nourish your dog and yourself, mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Dr. Alexia Meller. Thank you so much for being here with me today. It's so wonderful to have you joining me. I'm so excited to be kicking off some new conversations here on the podcast, all things nourishment for, for us and our dogs. And I wanted to start off actually this, I guess it's not really an official season. I'm not so sure if I am really ascribing to the idea of seasons to a degree. It's more like I'm more, I think, aligned with sort of natural seasons versus themed seasons. But I have taken on board the fact that you guys have reached out and said that you really want to know more about things like nutrition, for example. So I am going to be bringing some more attention to that, especially as I just told you guys about how I have created some programs and I'll be, I'll get into this in in the end as well, at the end of this um, episode, I'll give you some more details on different resources that I'm creating to help support you with nourishing your dog. But specifically, I'm coming from this perspective that I've called the new approach. And the reason that I have kind of, in a sense, branded it that way or labeled it that way is because as I've gone through my own journey with Lucky in terms of nutrition, and I've gone through my own spiritual journey and how he has been such an integral part of this, and as I've been supporting other clients with their dogs and on their journeys, I started to look at what I felt has been missing in the conversation around how we feed our dogs. And I wanted to sort of bring things together in a way, sort of, I guess, really kind of, in a sense, formalizing the way that I operate when I'm working with dogs, when I'm working with myself, when I'm working with clients, when I'm looking at what it means to actually nourish ourselves and our dogs, and kind of bring that into uh, a way that you guys can, can emulate if that feels resonant for you. Because my aim with all of this is that it goes well beyond the bowl. There's so much out there. If you're interested in just sort of like the, the nuts and bolts of how you put a diet together for your dog and whether or not you want that balanced according to particular guidelines that are set out by organizations like FDF or NRC or AFCO. You can even get formulating software yourself if you want to be formulating diets for your dog. But for me, it's so much more than that. It goes so beyond that. And I actually feel like we have lost the plot when we are so focused on what I recently saw um, Dr. Tom Lonsdale had, had spoken about, had framed it this way as chemical engineering. And that is what it feels like for me when we're um, trying to get all the micrograms balanced and all that kind of stuff. And again, as I've said before, I'm not against knowing what our dogs need, although there's a lot of question around that. There's no one way to actually feed your dog, but I think it requires taking a step back and actually look at feeding our dogs, nourishing our dogs. And nourishment involves so much more than food. Food is one part of it. So that's why I, I kind of brought everything together within the new approach. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that is for me. But the, the idea is that I wanted to create a way of thinking about not only what you're feeding your dog, but how feeding your dog is an opportunity to engage with this paradigm shift that we're in and to ultimately transform your life. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I have found that working in this way with Lucky has been transformative, not only to his health and not only to my own health, but to my life in general. Because as you know, I really look at the fact that our dogs are walking us home on this spiritual journey and how we care for them in the physical world is one part of it. But there is so much more that the whole relationship with our dogs is inviting us to explore, giving us permission to explore. And for me, that's what the new approach is really about. So for those who are not familiar with what the new approach is, I, I kind of introduced components of it over the summer in our little solo series, but the, the new approach, new is an acronym that stands for nutrition, 
energetics and well-being. And for me, it is those components together that really offer a key for supporting optimal health. But again, it's because it goes beyond the bowl. So when I'm talking about nutrition, I'll just give you a quick rundown of what that is. For me, nutrition focuses on species appropriate, biologically appropriate, bioavailable foods. That means foods and whole foods. That means foods that our dogs evolved to eat. So we are looking back in a sense at what have they what have their ancestors eaten in the wild what are their bodies actually able to recognize and break down because as i've mentioned before like the, the zinc for example that's in beef liver is drastically different to your dog's body than the zinc the synthetic forms of zinc that are put in kibble, for example, or I recently did an Instagram post talking about this, where even in terms of fresh foods, the iron that is found in meats is greatly more bioavailable to your dog's bodies than the iron that is found in spinach. So just because spinach is labeled as a high iron food doesn't actually mean that your dog's body can access that iron. So we want to start looking at rather than just the figures that are on the labels or on the spreadsheet, for example, if you're doing formulation of we, we can see that in, in theory, there is, you know, X amount of milligrams of zinc or iron or, or whatever in, in, the, in the particular food or in the bowl, we really need to start asking the question, but how much of this is accessible and available to my dog's body? And when we start to take that lens, that changes the way that we're, we're thinking about what we are putting in, in our dog's bowl and whether or not it's in a form that is recognizable to our dog's bodies. So that's what I'm talking about with biologically, or sorry, species appropriate, bioavailable, biologically appropriate foods for our dogs. The next component of the new approach is energetics. And this is where I'm looking at applying a traditional Chinese medicine lens to food energetics, but also how we're looking at the energetics of our dog's bodies, our bodies. Something that has been really resonant with me when it comes to traditional Chinese medicine is that it is a philosophy. It is a way of being and living in the world. I think in the West, we have tended to appropriate it and, and, not necessarily use it in the same ways or the same context uh, from the context in which it was created. We tend to actually apply our own allopathic lens to this, which I kind of problematize, to be honest, because in the West, we, tr we treat things, we do the same with herbalism, for example. So when I'm talking about allopathic, it's looking at what the symptom is and trying to get rid of the symptom. And so we look at like, this drug is good for this, this food is good for this, this herb is good for this, right? And we're sort of isolating the food, the, the herb, the supplement from its greater context. And we're generally looking at say like one component of it and not actually looking at how it's engaging with the system as, as a whole and how it is a system as a, its whole, own whole system. And so that's where I find it a little bit problematic. However, that being said, TCM and food energetics offers us such a useful way of reflecting upon this idea of balance and looking at balance is constantly shifting and changing. And although each and every living being is born with a particular energetic profile and a particular constitution, we are changing in response to what's going on with us internally, in terms of like what we've eaten, in terms of stresses we might be experiencing. We are changing in response to the climate around us, to the circumstances that we're in. That is all gonna affect the balance of the body. And it's the same for our dogs. So when we're using Chinese medicine as a way of helping to support our dogs by bringing their health into balance, and specifically when I'm talking about um, using it in terms of food energetics, we can really tailor, customize our dog's diet to where they're at right now. And I think that is such a beautiful way of addressing feeding is 
what is going on with our dog right now? Where might they be a little bit out of balance? Where do they need a little bit more support? And you tweak the diet in order to help support that. But one of the things that I find is really missing from the conversation when we're talking about feeding our dogs. There's a lot, there is a lot of conversation, especially now around uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, but I think it's the next component when we bring these things together that for me has made such a profound dif difference. And that is the well-being component of the new approach. And for me, well-being encompasses being well and using different modalities, using different ways of asking questions about our dogs, different ways of seeing our dogs that actually helps to bring everything together. So I've talked about how my whole journey into canine nutrition was really kickstarted by Lucky having severe gastrointestinal issues, and he started presenting with kidney issues really young. And I had to kind of figure all of this stuff out on my own. And I also noticed that I was kind of desperate, to be honest. You know, I, I hit that point. I did everything that I'm sure all of you guys have done too, where you're, you're trying anything and everything. And because I have been on the spiritual path for most of my life, although arguably in the last, I would say really this period that Lucky came into my life through today has been such a, it has just been a paradigm shift of a jump, um, which I'll talk about in relation to all of this. Prior to that, I still was really trying to fix things and I was trying to control things and I wasn't surrendering. I was angry that this was happening. I was worried. I had all the, the kind of normal, rational uh, responses to this that you, you would imagine. And I was desperate. And so I was willing to try pretty much anything. And it was actually through that desperation. So the gift of that des desperation where I started doing things like I found Reiki tracks online for like on YouTube designed specifically for dogs. And I noticed when I played them that he was a lot calmer and I thought, all right. So I just kept doing that. And it it actually reignited uh, an interest for me in different healing modalities. And whilst I initially kind of pursued them with this intention of fixing, so I definitely had this allopathic perspective at the time, what ended up happening through my experience of training in Reiki, for example, and training in holistic kinesiology and training in EFT, doing all of these different modalities, I became just intimately aware of how I was going about all of this the wrong way, that it wasn't actually about fixing him, that actually the way that healing happens, and this is a bit of a side note, but I'm going to bring this into the conversation here. The way that healing happens is not by the doctor healing you or the energy practitioner healing you. We have in the West, again, this kind of um, idea, for example, we even use the, the language of sending Reiki to somebody or to, to our animal. And it's not, I, I think that's inaccurate. That's not really what's happening. With something like Reiki, as an example, Reiki asks the practitioner to do work on themselves. And that, so it's a self-healing practice, practice at its core. And that by doing the inner work and by coming into a place of calm, by using the precepts that I've mentioned in previous videos, specifically the ones of just for today, I will not worry. And just for, to, for today, I will not anger that we are coming into a sense of presence and calm. We're, we're bringing our energy into sort of recollecting it into really coming into the now moment. And as we become Reiki, as we embody that calm energy, because everything else is connected, everything is one, right? And, and we know even from the law of entanglement in quantum physics that you can do something to a particle here and it will affect a particle on the other side of the universe, right? Everything is connected. As a result of that kind of entanglement, 
what starts to happen is that with the intention being set, and again, attention being about attention, intention and attention, giving focus to where we're, we're directing our energy. So as the practitioner, when I'm intending to connect with the client, that client is then invited to come into resonance, to come into coherence with the calm energy field that I have created. And the body then is given the ideal context in which to heal itself. It's why our bodies do the most healing when we are asleep at night, because we're in a calm, non-resistant state. And that's what these energy healing modalities are really doing. They're helping to facilitate, not send, but facilitate that context for the body to heal itself, mind, body, and soul level. And it's the same when we're doing it with our animals. And so this practice for me of things like Reiki and other healing modalities has really required me to shift the focus from what I'm seeing is the problem in the case of Lucky where he was having his health challenges and actually shift the focus onto me and look at how can I become incredibly self-compassionate? How can I release the things that I'm worrying about for the future or regretting about the past? How do I come into a state of presence? And for me, that didn't happen overnight. That has been been a kind of practice, but it's a deepening practice. And one of the things that I've noticed is that as I do this kind of work, it changes how lucky is. He becomes more calm. He becomes more deeply connected with me. He becomes healthier. He becomes happier because I am creating that space for that to occur. I'm not this crazy ball of stressed out energy walking around that I used to be that of course he was responding to like, what do I need to worry about? Because she's so worried, right? So the practice of really taking control of my own energy has that beautiful ripple effect of supporting him. So that's one aspect of the well-being component of the new approach, but it's, it's one that um, I think is quite important. It's important in my own practice, and it's something that I work with with clients, and I am also able to teach you guys how to do that. If that's something that you're interested in learning how to do, I can certainly support you in learning how to do energy working um, kind of modalities. So you can let me know in the comments or send me a message on Instagram at Mystic Dog Mama and let me know if you are curious about learning how to do some of these well-being practices uh, for yourself and for your dogs. So that's coming up, but I just wanted to kind of give you that intro to that's how the new approach works is by bringing nutrition, energetics, and well-being together and taking that whole dog perspective. And by taking that whole dog perspective, we're really taking our whole person perspective when it comes to us. So I wanted to, um, talk to you a little bit about how this has been transformational for me and give you some tips on some ways that you can be applying these kinds of perspectives now to help transform your own life and ultimately your dog's life too. And because I'm old school, I wrote it on paper. So I'm going <laughs> to grab my paper and my notes. And that's something also like, I just, I find it, um, just really helpful when I'm I'm thinking about these kinds of things to actually put pen to paper. There's something really lovely about that tangible experience. And I've been thinking a lot about how I want to introduce this stuff to you guys because it has been so important to me and so transformative. And I would love for you guys to just get a taste even of what this can do for, for your own life and give you some practical things that you can be applying right now. So I took a bit of time to kind of sit and meditate with this to see like, how did I, how, what have been the most, because there's been so many transformations for me, if I could boil it down into say like the top five things, what would that be? So that's what I was kind of thinking about. So I guess the first thing that I would say is that I've become intimately aware of the divine in everything. I used to say I was before, but I, but now as I have deepened that, I realize that was like surface level. And I am well aware that this path just continues to deepen and to grow. And I'm really excited to see how that kind of continues to unfold. But I think like, even doing simple practices, and this kind of links the nutrition with the well-being as well. I, I've told you before that I started doing things, again, initially out of sort of desperation, but it's been 
transformed into a beautiful spiritual ritual. I do things every day, like I bless Lucky's water because I know that water holds consciousness. And I know that when we direct our intention to things, that is how we are creating in the world. Whether you want to see it in the way that kind of the manifesting community talks about it, or even if you just want to look at it from the perspective that we are creating our world with how we are perceiving it. We are making assumptions, we are giving meanings, we, we are assigning what this world looks like to us by the meaning that we're giving it and by the intention and attention that we are focusing. So I choose to positively intend health and well-being for Lucky, knowing that water does carry consciousness and that that love, that deep love that I am transmitting into his water, and I do the same with his food, that that is being carried to him as a kind of blessing or an offering, a gift. And so in doing that simple ritual every single day, it has created this prayer for me and it has connected me more deeply in my own life. And I want to back up for a quick second because I mentioned that I see the new approach as a paradigm shift. And I feel like we are at this really beautiful, intense, difficult, strange moment in history where we're undergoing some serious evolution. There are some really amazing invitations that exist right now in this moment where we have the paradox of unbelievable terrors and unbelievable love at the same time. And this is where some of the things that I've taken away from A Course in Miracles when I was reading that have become really important for me and really helpful. And I want to share it with you. And that the one thing that I think has been really impactful and has really made it easy for me in a sense to be able to apply some of this on a more regular basis is to recognize that anything and ever, everything that we are doing is simply a choice point between love and fear. So what am I going to choose right now? Am I going to choose to see this as loving or am I going to choose to see it as fearful? Am I going to choose to respond out of love or am I going to choose to react out of fear? And I catch myself on the regular and interrupt my kind of habits or thought patterns and ask myself that and then redirect as much as I can course correct towards love. And that's where I think we're invited to do this at an individual level, but we're invited to do this at a, at a collective level. And so when I talk about our dogs walking us home on this spiritual path, this is part of it. This is the invitation that them being in our lives and the various things that they raise for us, or just the, just the nature of having a dog is going to raise for us, gives us all of these different choice points and asks us how loving can we be in any given moment? And so in this paradigm shift, for me, using this new approach as a kind of framework for how I'm engaging the spiritual path with Lucky has been one where I'm looking at how often can I choose love over fear? I sometimes do choose fear. I, I, I mean, it's a human thing, right? We're not, we're not perfect, but more times than not, I am choosing out of love and looking at how it is just the really small kinds of um, opportunities, the really small choice points that have a cumulative effect. And this is part of how we transform is through these small daily uh, opportunities to choose differently. It's not just the big things that happen in our lives, but it is the small things as well and how they build confidence for us in, in choosing again and again and again from a place of love. So one of the ways that I choose love is I choose to bless his food. I also choose as I am purchasing or preparing the meat that I am feeding him and the same with the plants, because I think the plants often get overlooked when we're talking about the spirit, the divine that's in everything. We can recognize it in animals, but we don't necessarily recognize it in plants. 
but I recognize it in all and I show gratitude and I honor that cycle of life. And I am grateful for the life force energy that has run through these beings and how their life force energy is now running through me or through Lucky in me preparing this food for him. And that brings such a deep sense of connection for me. And I think, you know, through my years of working in participatory art, where I was doing a lot of projects, working with a lot of different people, academia, corporate world, teaching, coaching, all the different environments that I've worked in. One of the most common things that I found that every single one of us is seeking is a sense of deep, meaningful purpose. We're seeking purpose. And that involves seeking connection and seeking love and seeking meaning and seeking a sense that what we are doing here matters. And while we often talk about purpose at a broader scale, you're, you'll know if you've listened to some of my earlier episodes where I introduce how I've started to think differently about purpose. Purpose for me happens on the micro scale. It is on those really small things, those small moments where you feel a pull towards something, where you recognize a connection with something. And for me, doing these little tiny rituals makes me feel so connected to not only the thing that I'm dealing with right then, but to this bigger cosmic thing that we're experiencing to the flow of life. And I know it sounds kind of like, I don't know, like Pollyanna or something like that, but it sounds sort of grandiose. And I would have said that even just a few years ago, but I've noticed that for myself, that the more that I do it at these small levels, the more I genuinely feel connected. And as a result, that's, I'm not seeking purpose. I'm not seeking a connection because I realize I am the connection. I am it. It's right here. It's right here. I don't have to look elsewhere for it. And the more that I am doing those small things, it's kind of like when I've described to you guys before about following your intuition and that the more you just take those small steps, you're demonstrating to your intuition, to your higher self, that you are willing to take action on what it is that you're receiving. And then you receive more. For me, it's been the same with this sense of purpose and connection. The more I demonstrate that I am feeling it, that I am accepting it, the more that starts to happen in bigger places in my life where I do genuinely feel more connected, more purposeful uh, at bigger levels in my life. So I just wanted to share that in case that's, that's kind of helpful for you. And back to kind of specifically where I've become aware of the divine in everything, that's also translated to, as I was saying, like recognizing I am the connection, really actually seeing the divine in myself, really seeing it, seeing it in lucky, seeing it in the problems that I experience, right? It's, so it's not just about trying to make everything look and feel better. It's actually seeing that everything is happening for me, not to me. And by stating that to myself and actually really recognizing and feeling that it puts me in an empowered position. It takes me out of victim role. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my dog? Right. And actually seeing, okay, this is happening for me. And so can I ask the question? Can I ask it a different question? And one of the questions that I find really helpful regarding this is what is the wisdom in this that I can learn? And to be fair, I'm not always in the right receptive mindset in the moment of something that's really triggering and frightening, but I'm getting better at it. And it's generally like shortly thereafter that I'm able to actually say, okay, I know there's wisdom here. What is it? And then I'm directing my, my lens towards looking for the wisdom instead of looking for the, the problem. So that has been something that's really helpful. And I just wanted to share that in case that's helpful for you too. What is the wisdom in this? The second way that I was reflecting upon how this, the new approach, this new way of engaging for me has transformed my own life is, this is specifically kind of looking at food, but it's, it's looking at food instead of chemical engineering. And this relates to what I was just talking about and what Tom Lonsdale had talked about, that 
instead of trying to focus on how do I get everything completely balanced and being really fearful about what that looks like. And again, I'm not saying that that's not important. I'm just saying it needs to be put into a context. But I think what was really inspiring to me when I was talking with Tom Lonsdale on the podcast, and if you've not listened to that episode, I will link it here. Um, it was such a beautiful conversation because the way that he came to his understanding that raw meaty bones are the key to the carnivore carnivore code, as he says, was through actually like a divine download. He had this beautiful like vision of a dream and came out of that. It was a Christmas morning and he just wrote it all down. And for him, it was about this understanding of this greater context of looking at the role that carnivores play in Gaia, in Gaia's energy, right? Like each being has its own role that it's playing. And the way that mother nature has such a beautiful way of keeping everything in checks and balances, that the way to kind of keep the carnivore population under control is actually through periodontal disease. And so one way to help prevent periodontal disease in nature and how we can replicate that with our dogs is through feeding raw meaty bones where the dog has to rip, tear, chew, all of that kind of stuff that is not only cleaning their teeth, but it's stimulating the production of stomach acid. It's releasing all the happy hormones in the brain. Like it is such a fulfilling experience. And this really helps solidify for me, not, not just about feeding raw meaty bones, which for me, they are the prime thing that I think about that, especially for, yes, there are some dogs that have trouble eating raw meaty bones. And then you want to think about that differently, but for the majority of dogs, they can do that. And I think if they can eat the raw meaty bone, that is the central component that we want to think about when we're feeding our dogs. But he, he was talking about how it really does ask us to look at feeding rather than just trying to compile chemicals, which is what we do in kibble, you know, and, and other kind of formulated um, concoctions like that. And I love the fact that it really speaks to as well, honoring how our dogs have evolved, honoring their physical, mental, emotional, spiritual needs, honoring the role that they play in the bigger environmental picture and in the cosmological picture, right? Like part of the role that they're here playing. And it reminded me very much as well, and this is sort of going back to my first thing of seeing the divine in everything. It reminded me of how a lot of indigenous tribes have such a different relationship to the world around them to nature, seeing themselves as part of nature. Whereas I think in the West, we have this tendency to see ourselves as separate from nature and actually battling nature, right? Trying to be in control of nature. And it reminded me of when I lived in Northern New Mexico and I talked with a lot of the Pueblo people about the relationships with nature and how they would describe honoring the spirits of the plants and animals that they were consuming. And I think a lot of different, a lot of different peoples have this kind of tradition, but I got to have these firsthand conversations, which was really important. And it's something that I think that we have gotten so far away from in the way that we have constructed our food chain that we don't have that same sense of reverence. We don't have that same sense of honoring the spirit of the animal. And I think that's also why we can feel so conflicted around feeding meat, for example. But for me, the way that I have gone about it is to look at where possible, can I buy something locally? Where possible, can I buy it from an organic farm, for example? But that isn't always possible for a number of reasons. But still, whenever I'm procuring something, any time before I'm preparing Lucky's food, I always do a blessing of gratitude over that food. And again, this reinforces for me that connection. That's an honoring the spirit of that being. 
it is such a profound experience and it seems really like small and light for example but again it's cumulative and it's just such a great reminder of how we are all connected to everything and how in blessing that food i also know that i am putting that intention of gratitude and blessing into it which will impact lucky he will be consuming that kind of that energy right because again kind of hinting back to energetics it's not just the energetics of the food, but your energy, when you are preparing that food, your intention absolutely impacts the food. It's why we talk about, you know, love being the missing ingredient that's in a lot of homemade foods that why you can, you can taste the difference um, between like your grandmother's cake or whatever, and something you bought at the store. And we talk about the adding that ingredient of love. And it's very true. It's very true. So taking the time to do those sorts of things to to recognize the spirit of the food and to put your gratitude and intention into that and that will impact not only you as you're giving that but also that impacts your dog ultimately and so the third thing that i was reflecting on was about how the new approach and this way of, of being has helped me to acknowledge and reconnect with my own innate wisdom. And this, I mean, for, um, in a couple of different ways. And so for, for one, I think probably all of you can relate to having that fear uh, at some point on your fresh feeding journey, whether or not you've started it yet, or whether you've been doing it for years, I know for me, I had this point of fear where I just didn't trust that I was going to be able to do it right. And so I kept feeding the kibble because I trusted that this was formulated to meet all of Lucky's needs. And it's a little bit like how we trust authority figures, or the, the white coat effect, right? That we will give our authority away to people who appear to be authority figures, and that's not to say to not consult with people who are experts, 100%. There is huge value in consulting with experts. But I think it's also important to recognize that you have your own inner wisdom too, your own inner knowing. And I fully believe that anything that you are getting from an expert needs to then be filtered through your own wisdom to see, is that right for me? And is that right for my dog? And I say this to my own clients too. Here are my suggestions, but I want you to sit with it. Tell me what feels right for you. What doesn't feel right for you? And then come back to me and talk to me about it. And we can make adjustments if necessary. But I still want people to feel empowered that they are making decisions because they have their own innate wisdom. And this is what allows us to become advocates for our own health and to become advocates for our dog's health too. And I think this is something that we're learning in this new paradigm or relearning, remembering in this new paradigm that we're going through, that we have the right to be experts, to advocate for ourselves. And I don't know how many of you have had this, this kind of an experience, but I've certainly had it in my own healthcare journey where I talked to Katie Hadley in an upcoming episode about this. She is a dietitian, a human dietitian that focuses specifically on helping people who suffer from IBS and SIBO. And one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to her is because I have a history of IBS. And I remember when I was at my the height of it, it was really, really bad in my mid twenties. And I went to the doctor and was like, I just, I, I need help with this. And like so many of us who, especially women, it tends to be who go to the doctor saying, we've got this thing going on. I was told it was in my head and I was prescribed antidepressants. And when that didn't work, because that's not what the problem was, the doctors were frustrated with me because I was creating a problem because it didn't just solve the, you know, they didn't just sort of solve the problem. And I remember feeling really frustrated that I wasn't being taken seriously. And I was, wasn't being trusted or believed with what was going on in my own body. And 
this is part of what I mean with, with trusting our own innate wisdom that you know what's going on with your body. You know what's going on with your dog too. Your vet is a professional that can help you, but you are the one that's with your dog more times than they are. If you're anything like me, like you're probably hovering over them as much as you can 24 seven, right? Like, so you get to see when something isn't quite right, when something isn't quite normal, you know, what's normal for them and what's not normal for them. And so this is an invitation to trust your own innate wisdom and to be your own advocate and your own, your dog's own advocate. And one way that I apply that within the, the, the new approach is not only in the conversation with my clients, if you're not feeling something like, let's talk about this, but also when I am using particular modalities and I can teach you to do different modalities as well that are really helpful. Something like holistic kinesiology or muscle testing is a really great example of something you can be doing yourself right now that is drawing upon your innate wisdom on your body's wisdom. And part of how muscle testing works, and if you're not familiar with muscle testing, it, there are different ways to actually do it. But what you're essentially doing is you're tapping into the body's wisdom. You're tapping into the subconscious by skipping over the, the conscious mind that will be like, yeah, well, this or no, or I don't know. And you're going directly to the source of the wisdom. And you were using different modalities that allow this to come out. And part of what it's based upon is that the, the body will respond th th with the muscles. They will respond with a strong or a weak response. And what that means is that when it's kind of a no or a false or that isn't right sort of experience, the muscles go weaker. When it's a strong positive or a yes kind of response, the muscles stay strong. And so we put the muscles in particular contexts where we're asking them, we're forcing them to show us a yes or a no. And so I've demonstrated um, like the rings where you, you make rings with your, your index fingers, for example, or some people will use their, their middle fingers. And you would ask a question. First, you want to ask your body to show you a clear yes or a clear no. But generally it would be like, if it's a, a yes, the ring stays strong. If it's a no, it would pull apart. I've mentioned before, I'm a huge fan of that. It's not the, it's, it's not the easiest one for me to do, but one that is really easy for me is the sway test where you do it standing up and you ask your body to show you a yes. And generally for me, it's a pull forward. You ask your body to show you a clear no, and it's, it will lean back and you're not doing this intentionally. It just is like a natural kind of swaying that's sort of happening. And I also use a pendulum to show me the same thing. And so I will hold, uh, for me, I have a rose quartz pendulum that I use and you steady your elbow on something, you hold the, the pendulum and just ask it to show you a clear yes and a clear no. And then you can use that to ask all kinds of yes and no questions. So I will use it on supplements. I will use it to better understand. So to understand whether or not a supplement is appropriate for a dog. I will use it for um, trying to identify where there might be issues with foods. I will do it also to look at where there might be trapped emotions in the body. I do it for myself. I do it for Lucky. I do it for clients and their dogs. And that's something that you can be doing for yourself and for your dog that is connecting to your deep wisdom, knowing that that wisdom is connected to the wisdom of the cosmos, right? And so although it seems kind of woo-woo, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably on board with some woo, right? But there have been so many studies that are showing that there is truth in this. And so that's something that you can use as a practice as well that helps to, again, reaffirm and create that kind of accumulation, accumulation of demonstrating that you're listening to yourself and demonstrating that you are acknowledging your own wisdom. So that's something that this new approach has helped me with. And that translates into me being able to have different kinds of conversations with my vet, for example, or different professionals. And I'm coming at it from a much more empowered position and able to say yes or no to something um, when it's suggested regarding Lucky's health. So there are really practical applications for it. And I just think it's something that is really easy to practice and get, get to know. And it's something that just builds a sense of connection with yourself and the acknowledgement that you, you are whole, you are enough, you do have wisdom, you do know what's going on at some level. So that is something that I have found is really helpful and has been transformative for me. And so the fourth thing is that you start to look at the world differently. 
And I think that that is so beautiful. So again, I was talking about how when we focus our attention and our, and our intention, we shape how we're perceiving the world, which is our experience of the world. And we even know from a quantum physics level with the whole, um, the double slit experiment that when we put focus on something, we change things at a, at a very like pragmatic level. And it reminds me of a quote that Dr. Wayne Dyer said that in, in order to change the things, or when you look at, when you change the way you look at things, the things you're looking at change. And that is so true. And so some ways that I apply that is, for example, um, when Lucky, I mentioned how, like when Lucky was first diagnosed with his GI and kidney issues, I was trying to control everything. And I was coming at it from a fear-based lens. I was not coming at it from a, a loving lens. I was not asking what's the wisdom in this for me. Like I was terrified and that's a natural state to be in. That's a natural phase to pass through, but it is that, can we pass through it? And so when we're in a position where we can start to look at things differently, when we can ask different questions about what it is that we're seeing, we do ultimately change things. We do change our experience. And I think that it, it, it's similar to what I've mentioned about cognitive bias before, that when you are expecting bad things, that's what you're looking for. And the universe responds by showing you more bad things because it's as if you're announcing, this is what I want to see. I want to see more crappy stuff happening. I want to see more illness. I want to see more lack. I want to see more disappointment. And so that's what it is that you see. But when you shift, when you choose differently, when you announce, no, that's great. That's a possibility for, for me to, to see and experience. Of course it is because anything and everything exists. So that is one possibility, but I choose differently. I choose to see something differently. And that is such an empowering place to be. So with Lucky's health, I started looking at, I choose to see him healthy, regardless of what's being presented to me through the blood tests or, or what have you. I'm choosing to see him as healthy. I'm not talking about denying and being delusional. I'm just announcing what it is I'm choosing to see, what I want to see, what I intend to see. And I did notice he started to get better. Whether or not it's connected to that doesn't matter. That was the experience. But even regardless of the blood work changing, right? I stopped focusing on all the negative things. And I started to see him in his happy moments. I saw more and more happy moments. I saw more and more healthy moments. And I reveled in that. I wasn't waiting for a different kind of outcome in order to enjoy him and to enjoy my life with him right now. And I think that's something that's really important, especially if you have a dog with a health challenge or you have a health challenge where there can be that sense of like, once I get through it, then. Once, once this is done, then, and that's part of why we're trying to use that allopathic approach of fixing, because we want this over with. But when I started focusing on what is the wisdom in this experience for me, and especially with something like kidney disease, this was really interesting because I've mentioned in a, a previous episode, how I went to a homeopath who did muscle testing on me as a proxy for Lucky and identified trapped emotions in Lucky's body. And a couple of the prominent emotions that came up were fear, which is associated with the kidneys and abandonment. And I have mentioned in the, in the beginning of the podcast that part of Lucky's story is that when he was two weeks old, his mom was killed by um, a car, was hit by a car. And then he was given to me when he was 12 weeks old. So there's been this pattern of him losing important things in, a, in his life. And so I wasn't surprised actually when that came up as being trapped and how that was then creating physical ailments. So the wisdom actually in those physical ailments showing up allowed me to see what was underlying it and how I could help him release that. And there are ways that you can do that through actually identifying with muscle testing and then releasing through magnets of all things of helping the body to get rid of that um, emotion. So if you were interested in knowing more about how to do that, let me know. Cause I can certainly talk to you about how that's done. It can even be done with your fingertips because your fingertips are magnetic. So I'd be happy to talk to you about that. But then I was able to notice how 
I was, like I said, I was just waiting for things to get better before I could enjoy him. And when I switched that, when I switched it, so I wasn't waiting for another time, but recognizing that everything is happening in this now moment, there is no tomorrow, right? When we experience tomorrow, it's actually our today, right? It is the now moment. So how could I find loving, joyful moments with him now? And that was transformative, not only for my relationship with him. And I did notice that he he just seemed to have more and more good moments, right? But I was different. I was totally different. I was more present in my life generally. I wasn't just waiting for something else to be different. And I was also becoming empowered of not letting my external circumstances dictate how I was going to feel about myself, where that was a huge pattern for me of like, oh, well, I don't have the money to do this, or I don't have this or what, you know, whatever it would be. And I would limit myself based upon the physical 3D experiences. And it's not saying that those 3D, 3D experiences don't exist. What I am saying is that, but I don't have to let them change how I am feeling about myself and my life. That's a choice. I'm feeling it internally. When we're seeking things, when we say that we want things like we want a relationship or we want to go on vacation here, or we want, we want a house or, you know, whatever it is that we're seeking in the 3D, we're seeking it because we think that it's going to give us a particular feeling. But guess where that feeling comes from? Not from the thing, the house or the money, or the vacation, or the good health, or whatever, isn't handing over a feeling to you. You are cultivating that feeling internally in response to those things. So you can cultivate it or conjure it at any time. And that's what I practice doing. And that in and of itself, if you only take that one thing from all of this, that is transformational. So that was change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. And the final thing, the fifth thing that I wanted to talk to you about was something seemingly simple, but so unbelievably profound. And that is the level of deep peace that I finally experienced and continue to experience despite what is going on around me that persists and I think that's the beautiful thing that that I've experienced is that it's not just a fleeting moment like it used to be. It wasn't like an every now and again, I feel a sense of peace. It's even within the most stressful, difficult experiences that I have gone through and that I'm even going through right now in my life. But I am in a different relationship to it. And I think that has using the kind of language that we we speak about with our dogs that has definitely reduced my reactivity because i saw how reactive i was i was waiting for the other shoe to drop all the time waiting for the feeling like the external was kind of coming at me and i was just going to have to re react to everything and instead anchoring in that that inner peace that that deeper connection, that deeper wisdom, the deeper sense of who I am and allowing the things to happen around me, but to not attach to them in the same way. That specifically in my in regards to my relationship with Lucky has been unbelievably transformative because I've talked about before how one of the issues I've had with Lucky because he's a pandemic pup and because of his kind of nature and the, the various circumstances, reactivity has been a real struggle. But the more that I've worked on cultivating my own inner peace, the less reactive he gets. And I've noticed that it translates into, even when he is in a reactive episode, if something happens when we're out, I'm not adding fuel to the fire because I'm in a calm space. And that doesn't mean that I'm not responding to what's going on. Like, you know, I'm moving him away from the triggers or what have you, but I'm not attaching a story about it. I'm not ruminating about it. I'm not trying to make somebody else wrong or the person who's not taking care of their off-leash dog. You know, all, all of the stuff that I used to create stories about that I used to really get so attached to a particular narrative that put me in the role of victim, whether I was conscious of that or not, none of that's there anymore. None of it's there. And it is so empowering. And so 
that again, this is where I'm talking about how it goes beyond the bowl. When we're nourishing our dogs, it goes well beyond what we are putting in the bowl. That's one part of it. But I look at how I am now creating a much more calm, grounded, centered environment for the both of us because I'm in charge of my own energy now. I'm not allowing my energy to go here, there, and everywhere or be controlled by other things in the external and making myself the victim. I am fully embodying it and being responsible for my own energy and recognizing that I am creating my own experiences. Doesn't mean I'm necessarily creating the the kind of physical 3D thing that I'm seeing, although some may argue that that we are, but I am controlling how I'm responding to that. That is what I have control over. And the more that I take responsibility for that, the more that he is living in a calm state. And that has a ripple effect on his behavior. So on his mental, emotional, and spiritual health. And it it has an impact on his body. It has an impact on the way he eats. It has an impact on how he's digesting things, right? Because I've created a safe space for both of us. So that's what I mean about how the new approach has been really transformative for me. And so I, I just wanted to kind of bring that to your awareness so that as you're kind of going through your day, looking at where can you choose differently? Where can you choose a moment of love over fear? How can you take a moment just to show gratitude for the food that your dog is eating, for example. And even with the, the TCM and food energetics, I, I don't, I didn't mention it today, but I have in um, past episodes and when I was speaking about it on, on Instagram. But one of the things that I find most beautiful about TCM is that at its heart, it is about balance and connection, everything being connected, right? It's about the flow of this universal life force energy through all of these different beings that are, are on earth, that we're, we're all little sparks of the divine, right? But it's also about observation and connecting to that deep inner wisdom. So for example, I've mentioned, if you want to kind of explore the energetics of your own dog, if you're not sure, like, do they lean towards cool or warm? Uh, or do they tend to be a little bit damp or dry? And then how could you use foods to help support them? It all begins with observation, just watching, just take note. And that in and of itself is a practice that will bring you into a sense of presence and bring you into a place of non-judgment, because it's not about looking at what's wrong with your dog, which is often the lens that we come at it, right? From the West of like, you're trying to figure out what the problem is, but just watch him, just watch what are they showing you? What are they telling you? What are they communicating with you? Even if you're not doing telepathic animal communication, although you can, you can absolutely do that as I've mentioned before. And if you want to learn how to do it, let me know. But they are showing you in everything that they're doing and being. And so come into that moment and just watch, just observe and then see how you feel in response. So that's just an overview of the new approach and how I'm applying it um, in terms of feeding dogs, but also how, again, it goes well beyond the bowl and how it has been so transformational in how I'm showing up in my own life and how that has a ripple effect on how lucky is in his life and how people are engaging with me um, out in the world. You know, like it, it has such a profound effect. And my hope is that in sharing this with you, that there's something in there that really resonates with you, that invites you to step into the fullness that you are. It come into a sense of presence, to look at things a little bit differently, to show up with a little bit more love for yourself, that you're doing the best that you can for your dog. And that's such a noble, beautiful thing, but making sure too, that you're doing the best for you and that it's not about fixing your dog, but looking at what is the wisdom that all of what you're experiencing is showing you? So I hope that that was helpful. I am putting together an ebook that will be available on the new approach that is essentially set up. It's a little bit like a manifesto of how we use this to help change, change ourselves and, and change the world. But it's a really great guide for how to feed your dog. It's designed at the moment for healthy adult dogs. Um, but the idea is that if you're kind of confused about how you 
want to feed your dog and you want some support, um, you, you kind of want some guidance on what you should be feeding, how you want to think about raw BD bones, how, how you calculate uh, the percentage of bone in anything that you're feeding them, some uh, easy guidance on food energetics from a TCM perspective and how that's applied with examples to some of the most common things that you'll be finding for your dog and feeding your dog. And then also, also some really helpful well-being techniques that you can be applying. Like I said, you don't have to be a Reiki master to do the kind of well-being component of it. There are some really easy things that I guide you through doing that you can help support yourself and your dog. So I will be having that available. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that was helpful. And I'd love to hear if there were any nuggets that stood out for you, or if there are any particular practices that you already have that you have found helpful for deepening your connection to yourself and the universe and your dog. I'd love to hear. So you can feel free to leave a note in the comments or message me on Instagram at Mystic Dog Mama, or even contact me through my website, mysticdogmama.com. And if you'd like me to support you with your dog's health journey, and if this new approach really resonates with you, reach out to me as well. I am offering consultations at the moment, and I'm also offering a back to school special on any nutrition and wellness plans that are booked in the month of September. So if this feels like something you would like to try, if you're interested in a beyond the bowl approach to how you support your dog, how you nourish your dog, and how ultimately that helps you to nourish yourself, then please reach out. You can message me on Instagram at Mystic Dog Mama, or again, reach out to me on my website, mysticdogmama.com. All right. Thank you again. And until next time.